So we are in the week three of a four-week series on prayer. And so we turn this morning to a very familiar prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And what I want you to, to, to point to is we're going to start in verse 9 of chapter 6, is that this passage that we're going to read here follows shortly after the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. So with that in mind, picking up in chapter 6 of Matthew, you can read along on the screen or follow along in your Bible. We read, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So one of the experiences we have quite frequently in our household is to listen to children's prayers. Children's prayers are often a delight to listen to. Here's a couple of examples that uh, we may not have heard in our household, but that I came across this week. Dear God, good day. No fall down. Here's another one. Dear God, my mom tells me that you have a reason for everything on earth. I guess broccoli is one of your mysteries. <laughs> or, dear God, I need you to make my mom not allergic to cats. I really want a cat, and I really don't want to ask my mom to move out. <laughs> So we smile, we do all the time in our household, we smile at the prayers of God's little people. But sometimes I feel like I haven't grown up that much. I still find myself praying sometimes, dear God, good day, no fall down. If you're like me, you could use some help with your prayer life, and you're in good company, I'm sure. The disciples felt the same way. Jesus had not yet taught them much about prayer. He had just prayed. Finally, after seeing the connection between private prayer and public power, they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Do you ever feel like saying, Lord, teach me to pray? You see, I don't need to give more time to my job. In fact, Many people would be good here to cut down on the amount of work that they do. Workaholism is a serious disease that is found in this country. I spend a lot of time, as I'm sure many of you do, trying to devote and carve out as much time to spend with your loved ones as you can. But I also need, know that I need more quantity and quality time of prayer in my life. Lord, teach me to pray. Are there ways that we can strengthen our church? Absolutely. There always are. But our biggest need is, Lord, teach us to pray. When the disciples got around to making this request, Jesus gave them what we just read to, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Notice they didn't ask him to give him give them a benediction to close their service, or even how to, uh, to rightfully close uh, a business meeting. No, they asked him for help in prayer. He gave them a model prayer, one that could cover the bases, if you will, that could be used kind of as an agenda for a personal or public prayer. That's the way Martin Luther took it. When his barber asked for help in prayer, Luther wrote him this long letter. He said, I regard the Lord's prayers as the best of all prayers, superior even to the Psalms, which I am very fond of. Indeed, it turns out that it was composed and taught by the real master. What a pity it is that such a prayer by such a master should be babbled and garbled so thoughtlessly throughout the whole world. Luther called the Lord's prayer the greatest martyr, for everybody tortures and abuses it. He encouraged his barber to use it as a model, saying one phrase at a time, then allowing the Spirit to help fill in the rest. Now this 
thing that he's referencing here is the very thing I mentioned last Sunday about we can get in the habit, and many churches do this, of just rote repetition of this prayer, as if there is some power that comes merely from saying the words. Jesus wasn't teaching them exactly what to say, but rather how to pray. So the, Jesus is, or the disciples are saying, Lord, teach us to pray. When they do that, they likely receive the same answer as the barber did. It isn't really the Lord's prayer, it is ours. He didn't say our Father because he was the unique, because he was the unique Son of God. And he certainly didn't need to be forgiven of anything. May we use it for the purpose it was given to us, to teach us how to pray. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. The Lord's Prayer is our prayer. Let us use it for the purpose it was given by Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. So today I'm going to do something a little different and not have points as much as just kind of going through each phrase in there. So you can follow along in your sermon notes if you would like that are in your bulletin. So first, our Father. The children's prayers we began with focus on me and my, what the kid wants. That's all right for kids. But sooner or later, we all have to realize that the universe does not revolve around us, but around God. Prayer focuses on God and his kingdom, not me and mine. Our reminds me that I have been joined to a family. You all have been joined to a family often closer than one's own, one owns nuclear unit. We have been adopted into the family of God. Together, we have one father. There's a story I read about a missionary boy who played in a high school basketball team in Japan. After one game, he said, I had my best game tonight. A fan replied, but I didn't see you playing at all. He answered, I wasn't, but I was praying during the game for the other players. The boy had learned the meaning of our. Father, one of the first words that an infant, listen, an infant learns, and for you dads, you know the great joy that you receive when you hear father or daddy, just like you moms will with mommy. A father loves hearing it. And so does God. He loves to hear when we say, Abba, Father. He told the children of Israel to call him my father. It's to call down the care of the one who brings us into his family, who gives us a sense of belonging, and who listens to our every cry. It's the spirit that helps us say, Father, because we are loved, appreciated, and cared for. Breathe in the Father's love as you say it. Whether your earthly father was close or distant, caring or callous, your heavenly father is all you ever needed and wanted in a dad. We know about our father because Jesus revealed him to us. Jesus taught us to say, Father. No, we are not natural children. We are by nature alienated from God. It took the death and the resurrection of Christ, uh, of Christ to make this adoption possible. Who art in heaven. This reminds us that God doesn't miss anything. When Daniel needed to know the dream of the king and what the meaning was, the Lord knew everything and revealed it, sparing him and his friends from being killed. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. The Lord's throne is in heaven, beyond space and time. He is not engulfed by the pressures that assail us. Hallowed be thy name. God's fatherhood draws us close to him. His holiness separates him from, his, from an unholy creation. 
It keeps us from presuming upon his fatherhood. He doesn't accept us on any terms. All roads do not lead to heaven. Those not willing to reckon with God's holiness will not experience his love. When we say, hallowed be thy name, we are asking that his name be kept holy in our lives. When the curtains are pulled back momentarily, allowing us to take a glimpse, what we see always is holy, holy, holy. The quality of God which most causes worship from the angels is his holiness. This, apart from anything else, more than anything else, sets him apart from his creation. There is no darkness in his character, no flaws in his perfection, no weakness in his faithfulness. Recently, some high school star football players, I'm sorry, some star football players from a university were arrested for grand theft. The coaches said it would damage recruiting for the years to follow. These players gave the university a bad name. They didn't change the university, but they tainted its reputation. If God's children act in ways unbecoming of his family, we give him a bad name. We haven't changed his character, his holy character, but we have defamed his name. When we don't sanctify the Lord's name in our lives, within our conversation, our thoughts, and our actions, the world doesn't think much of our God. O oh Lord, may, our, may your name be holy among us. Thy kingdom come. Daniel watched a succession of world kingdoms come and go. He prophesied about one that would start as a small pebble but would topple every other world empire. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray for that kingdom to come and in power. God is concerned about government. History is the story of the rise and fall of kings and kingdoms. God has made his choice for the world's ruler, his own son. We pray for that kingdom to come. When we see other governments distorting justice, Encouraging crime, ignoring misery, punishing the innocent, we, we yearn for God's government. When we see disharmony in family, broken relationships, unkept promises, shattered lives, we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. Because we know that when the government rests upon his shoulders, things will be different. His government is here in part, but ultimately we are praying, Maranatha, come, Lord. To say thy kingdom come is to offer a prayer that can and will be answered, now in part, but in the future, in full. Lord, let your kingdom come to my life, to my home, to our church, to our government. Your rule brings righteousness joy, and peace in the Spirit. My rule, our earthly rule, brings discouragement, tension, and unrest. <clears throat> Lord, we need your leadership in abundance. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Luther knew that there was no match for Satan when he wrote, We are far too weak to cope with the devil, and all his might and his forces arrayed against us, trying to trample us underfoot. But by prayer alone we shall be a match both for them and for the devil. If only we persevere diligently and do not become slack. For whenever a faithful Christian prays, Dear Father, thy will be done. God replies from on high, Yes, dear child, it shall be done in spite of the devil and all the world. How is God's will done in heaven? 
quickly, accurately, and joyfully. Those wanting God's kingdom are seeking his will. Most on earth dare to rebel against King Jesus. Heaven wouldn't dare to do such a thing. It did once, and that was the first and last time. Jesus prayed, not not as I will, but as you will. God's will is good. But it's certainly not easy. Because of the conflicts of our kingdoms and his, we need to battle in prayer. A realization that we are engaged in a fight. A fight that we cannot win in the flesh, but that we fight on our knees in prayer. Give us our daily bread. Now having focused on God and his kingdom, I am now ready to say it's time to include what my needs are. We focused on giving adoration to who God is and to speaking uh, how we fight these battles through prayer. Now we can come with our needs. To start and end with me is like praying as an infant. Is this how you pray? Dear God, help me to find my keys to get to this parking space, to get us a promotion, to afford new furniture, to pass my test. In Jesus' name, amen. Now those may seem like silly requests, but it's a laundry list of what we need, what we want. Most of us, frankly, have been pursuing the American dream, consumed with self. To pray right means that we put kingdom priorities above our own. I said this last week that, you know, for the amount of time that we spend, and I've, I've heard others spend here and other places, and the amount of time that I've spent in my life praying for the needs of people, and yes, we should do that. We should be equally, if not more so, praying for God's kingdom to come on earth. That how we live is to be representative of the king. Jesus does want us to come before him with our needs, so don't bypass that. A Norwegian pastor and writer once said, prayer is letting God into my helplessness. Rather than to try to tough it out on our own, we are encouraged to come before God as needy children. And God is good. He is a good Father. We are not praying, give us this day our daily cheesecake. Although Emily knows I would love to pray that. Bread speaks of the essentials of life, not desserts. We are praying to have our needs supplied, and we never graduate from dependency. Each day has enough concerns. You heard, we heard a whole bunch of them this morning. Just the concerns, just, those are just the ones that were lifted this morning. We all face a plethora of concerns each and every day. And we pray to God to give us daily provision. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. A boy spilled his milk and his mom said nothing. Just grabbed a rag and cleaned it up. He said, you're the best mom in the world. We mess up. Not to acknowledge our messes is to accumulate a big debt. We owe God perfect righteousness. And when we can't do that, the only thing we can do rightfully is to declare bankruptcy and ask God to forgive our debt. Bankruptcy is a major issue in this country. We all need to declare bankruptcy before God. We cannot possibly pay back the massive debt that we incur. We need to ask for forgiveness daily, reminding us of our bankrupt condition. I need to do it daily. 
Because sin is so much in me. We need to understand the debts that come before us. And that each one of us has similar debts. I'm glad we have a great treasurer in our congregation who keeps honest and accurate records for our receipts and debts. She's got skills I've never learned, even having been a math teacher. I have not done all of that side of it. But I'm even more thankful that God does not keep record of the debts I owe him. May I take the grace that he so freely pours out on me and share it with others, rather than keeping some tally sheet in my mind of those who have offended me. I think that's part of the reason why this testimony time is so vital to me. This opportunity to share about the grievances, or, or not the grievances, but the, the, the debts with which have been laid, or the things that have been laid before our paths, and how God has helped work through that. We all sit here and, and acknowledge, I know everyone in here would rightfully acknowledge that they have sin in their lives. And they've seen God work through that in miraculous ways. And yet we will willingly sit with our hands on our seats and not be encouraging to others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A hymn wrote, writer wrote, Prone to wander, Lord, prone to leave the God I love. This petition acknowledges our weakness, our weak nature. Evil is all around us and within us. We are weak. We only need to ask forgiveness for our failure. I'm sorry, we not only need to ask for forgiveness for our failure, but also safety and protection against the ongoing sin and against Satan. Deliver us from evil could also be translated, deliver us from the evil one. He offers to deliver us. He offers to give us a way out whenever temptation is laid at our door. The way out is not through our flesh. That's the, that is a, uh, a recipe for more disaster. The way out is from praying, God, deliver us from this. God, put other people in my life if I need to have that be the way that you speak to me so that I remove myself from this situation. You see, we do not live in a neutral universe. It is not random and have no uh, good or bad to it. We cannot say, even though I do all the time, I have to be watchful, we can't say whatever will be, will be. We live in a messed up world. Satan's going to get his licks in. Our world has been devastated by sin and the devil. He's stronger than we are, but he's no match for Jesus. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we close this morning with the doxology of this, and it's, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, most ancient manuscripts do not include this closing, but the church has used it consistently from the earliest times. It appears to be some kind of a liturgical addition, but it is very, it's a very worthy ending of praise. So I'll close with this, and it's a story, of, it's a story that I shared with an individual here at the church about a different situation. Um, the particulars which will not be made known, but it was talking about dealing with conflict, with conflict with a, an individual person. And I said, you know, there's, there's something that I learned that was very helpful, that I think we can take from the scripture, but also take from practical learning. I learned this when I was back teaching, and they said, and, and I remember a trainer coming in and saying, Aaron, if you have to give something hard, some hard advice, or some hard truth, treat it like a sandwich. 
You start off with some positive, something praising who they are. You give them something good. Not false. You don't make something up. It's got to be genuine. You close with something else that's, that says, you know, this is why you're worthy of being, or this is why I, I'm coming to you because I value this. And then in the middle, it's where the real work is at. And I think it's symbolic here that we open the prayer with praise. And we close also with praise. Because ultimately, we all know who is in control. Even when our lives belie that. Because frankly, they do a lot. But it's God is in control. And so we are reminded today that the Lord's Prayer is our prayer. And so as you use it going forward, use it for the purpose that it was given to by Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray. Let's pray.